Chapter fourteen of The Warden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Warden by Anthony Trollope. Chapter fourteen. Mount Olympus. Wretched in spirit, groaning under the feeling of insult, self condemning and ill satisfied in every way, Bold returned to his London lodgings. Ill as he had fared in his interview with the archdeacon, he was not the less under the necessity of carrying out his pledge to Eleanor, and he went about his ungracious task with a heavy heart. The attorneys whom he had employed in London received his instructions with surprise and evident misgiving. However, they could only obey, and mutter something of their sorrow that such heavy costs should only fall upon their own employer especially as nothing was wanting but perseverance to throw them on the opposite party. Bold left the office which he had latterly so much frequented, shaking the dust from off his feet, and before he was down the stairs an edict had already gone forth for the preparation of the bill. He next thought of the newspapers. The case had been taken up by more than one, and he was well aware that the keynote had been sounded by the Jupiter. He had been very intimate with Tom Towers, and had often discussed with him the affairs of the hospital. Bold could not say that the articles in that paper had been written at his own instigation. He did not even know as a fact that they had been written by his friend. Tom Towers had never said that such a view of the case or such a side in the dispute would be taken by the paper with which he was connected. Very discreet in such matters was Tom Towers and altogether indisposed to talk loosely of the concerns of that mighty engine of which it was his high privilege to move in secret some portion. Nevertheless, Bold believed that to him were owing those dreadful words which had caused such panic at Barchester, and he conceived himself bound to prevent their repetition. With this view he betook himself from the attorney's office to that laboratory where, with amazing chemistry, Tom Towers compounded thunderbolts for the destruction of all that is evil, and for the furtherance of all that is good, in this and other hemispheres. Who has not heard of Mount Olympus, that high abode of all the powers of type, that favoured seat of the great goddess Pica, that wondrous habitation of gods and devils, from whence with ceaseless hum of steam and never-ending flow of Castalian ink, issue forth fifty thousand nightly edicts for the governance of a subject nation. Velvet and gilding do not make a throne, nor gold and jewels a sceptre, it is a throne because the most exalted one sits there, and a scepter because the most mighty one wields it. So it is with Mount Olympus. Should a stranger make his way thither at dull noonday, or during the sleepy hours of the silent afternoon, he would find no acknowledged temple of power and beauty, no fitting fane for the great thunderer, no proud facades and pillared roofs to support the dignity of this greatest of earthly potentates. To the outward and uninitiated eye, Mount Olympus is a somewhat humble spot, undistinguished, unadorned, nay, almost mean. It stands alone, as it were, in a mighty city, close to the densest throng of men, but partaking neither of the noise nor the crowd. A small, secluded, dreary spot, tenanted, one would say, by quite unambitious people at the easiest rents. Is this Mount Olympus? asks the unbelieving stranger is it from these small dark dingy buildings that those infallible laws proceed which cabinets are called upon to obey by which bishops are to be guided lords and commons controlled judges instructed in law generals in strategy admirals in naval tactics and orange women in the management of their barrows Yes, my friend, from these walls, from here issue the only known infallible bulls for the guidance of British souls and bodies. This little court is the Vatican of England. Here reigns a pope, self-nominated, self-consecrated, I and much stranger, too, self-believing, a pope whom, if you cannot obey him, I would advise you to disobey as silently as possible, a pope hitherto afraid of no Luther, a pope who manages his own inquisition, who punishes unbelievers as no most skilful inquisitor of Spain ever dreamt of doing, one who can excommunicate thoroughly, 
fearfully, radically, put you beyond the pale of men's charity, make you odious to your dearest friends, and turn you into a monster to be pointed at by the finger. Oh, heavens, and this is Mount Olympus! It is a fact amazing to ordinary mortals that the Jupiter is never wrong. With what endless care, with what unsparing labor do we not strive to get together for our great national council the men most fitting to compose it? And how we fail! Parliament is always wrong. Look at the Jupiter, and see how futile are their meetings, how vain their council, how needless all their trouble. With what pride do we regard our chief ministers, the great servants of state, the oligarchs of the nation on whose wisdom we lean, to whom we look for guidance in our difficulties? But what are they to the writers of the Jupiter? They hold counsel together, and with anxious thought painfully elaborate their country's good, but when all is done, the Jupiter declares that all is not. Why should we look to Lord John Russell? Why should we regard Palmerston and Gladstone when Tom Towers, without a struggle, can put us right? Look at our generals, what faults they make, at our admirals, how inactive they are. What money, honesty, and science can do is done, and yet how badly are our troops brought together, fed, conveyed, clothed, armed, and managed. The most excellent of our good men do their best to man our ships, with the assistance of all possible external appliances, but in vain. All, all is wrong. Alas, alas! Tom Towers, and he alone, knows all about it. Why, oh why, ye earthly ministers, why have ye not followed more closely this heaven-sent messenger that is among us? Were it not well for us in our ignorance that we confided all things to the Jupiter? Would it not be wise in us to abandon useless talking, idle thinking, and profitless labor? Away with majorities in the House of Commons, with verdicts from judicial bench given after much delay, with doubtful laws and the fallible attempts of humanity. Does not the Jupiter, coming forth daily with fifty thousand impressions full of unerring decision on every mortal subject, set all matters sufficiently at rest? Is not Tom Towers here, able to guide us, and willing? Yes, indeed, able and willing to guide all men in all things, so long as he is obeyed as autocrat should be obeyed with undoubting submission. Only let not ungrateful ministers seek other colleagues than those whom Tom Towers may approve. Let church and state, law and physic, commerce and agriculture, the arts of war and the arts of peace, all listen and obey, and all will be made perfect. Has not Tom Towers an all-seeing eye? From the diggings of Australia to those of California, right round the habitable globe, does he not know, watch, and chronicle the doings of every one? From a bishopric in New Zealand to an unfortunate director of a northwest passage, is he not the only fit judge of capability? From the sewers of London to the central railway of India, from the palaces of St. Petersburg to the cabins of Connaught, nothing can escape him. Britons have but to read, to obey, and be blessed. None but the fools doubt the wisdom of the Jupiter. None but the mad dispute its facts. No established religion has ever been without its unbelievers, even in the country where it is the most firmly fixed. No creed has been without scoffers. No church has so prospered as to free itself entirely from dissent. There are those who doubt the Jupiter. They live and breathe the upper air, walking here unscathed, though scorned. Men, born of British mothers and nursed on English milk, who scruple not to say that Mount Olympus has its price, that Tom Towers can be bought for gold. Such is Mount Olympus, the mouthpiece of all the wisdom of this great country. It may probably be said that no place in this nineteenth century is more worthy of notice. No treasure mandate armed with the signatures of all the government has half the power of one of those broad sheets, which fly forth from hence so abundantly, armed with no signature at all. Some great man, some mighty peer, will say a noble duke, retires to rest feared and honored by all his countrymen, fearless himself, 
if not a good man, at any rate a mighty man, too mighty to care much for what men may say about his want of virtue. He rises in the morning degraded, mean, and miserable, an object of men's scorn, anxious only to retire as quickly as may be to some German obscurity, some unseen Italian privacy, or indeed anywhere out of sight. What has made this awful change? What has so afflicted him? An article has appeared in the Jupiter. Some fifty lines of a narrow column have destroyed all his grace's equanimity, and banished him for ever from the world. No man knows who wrote the bitter words. The clubs talk confusedly of the matter, whispering to each other this and that name, while Tom Towers walks quietly along Pall Mall, with his coat buttoned close against the east wind, as though he were a mortal man, and not a god dispensing thunderbolts from Mount Olympus. It was not to Mount Olympus that our friend Bold betook himself. He had before now wandered round that lonely spot, thinking how grand a thing it was to write articles for the Jupiter, considering within himself whether by any stretch of the powers within him he could ever come to such distinction, wondering how Tom Towers would take any little humble offering of his talents, calculating that Tom Towers himself must have once had a beginning, have once doubted as to his own success. Towers could not have been born a writer in the Jupiter. With such ideas, half ambitious and half awestruck, had Bold regarded the silent-looking workshop of the gods. But he had never yet by word or sign attempted to influence the slightest word of his unerring friend. On such a course was he now intent, and not without much inward palpitation did he betake himself to the quiet abode of wisdom, where Tom Towers was to be found a mornings inhaling ambrosia and sipping nectar in the shape of toast and tea. Not far removed from Mount Olympus, but somewhat nearer to the blessed regions of the west, is the most favored abode of Temis. Washed by the rich tide which now passes from the towers of Caesar to Barry's halls of eloquence, and again back, with new offerings of a city's tribute, from the palaces of peers to the mart of merchants, stand those quiet walls which law has delighted to honor by its presence. What a world within a world is the temple! How quiet are its entangled walks, as someone lately has called them, and yet how close to the densest concourse of humanity, how gravely respectable its sober alleys, though removed but by a single step from the profanity of the Strand and the low iniquity of Fleet Street. Old St. Dunstan, with its bell-smiting bludgeoners, has been removed. The ancient shops, with their faces full of pleasant history, are passing away one by one. The bar itself is to go, its doom has been pronounced by the Jupiter. Rumor tells us of some huge building that is to appear in these latitudes dedicated to law, subversive of the courts of Westminster, and antagonistic to the Rolls and Lincoln's Inn, but nothing yet threatens the silent beauty of the temple. It is the medieval court of the metropolis. Here, on the choicest spot of this choice ground, stands a lofty row of chambers, looking obliquely upon the sullied Thames. Before the windows, the lawn of the temple garden stretches with that dim yet delicious verdure so refreshing to the eyes of Londoners. If doomed to live within the thickest of London smoke, you would surely say that that would be your chosen spot. Yes, you, you whom I now address, my dear middle-aged bachelor friend, can nowhere be so well domiciled as here. No one here will ask whether you are out or at home, alone or with friends. Here no Sabbatarian will investigate your Sundays, no censorious landlady will scrutinize your empty bottle, no valetudinarian neighbor will complain of late hours. If you love books, to what place are books so suitable? The whole spot is redolent of topography. Would you worship the Paphian goddess, the groves of Cyprus are not more taciturn than those of the temple. Wit and wine are always here, and always together. The revels of the temple are as those of polished Greece, where the wildest worshipper of Bacchus never forgot the dignity of the god whom he adored. Where can retirement be so complete as here? Where can you be so sure of all the pleasures of society? 
It was here that Tom Towers lived, and cultivated with eminent success the tenth muse who now governs the periodical press. But let it not be supposed that his chambers were such or so comfortless as are frequently the gaunt abodes of legal aspirants. Four chairs, a half-filled deal bookcase with hangings of dingy green bays, an old office table covered with dusty papers, which are not moved once in six months, and an older Pembroke brother with rickety legs, for all daily uses. A dispatcher for the preparation of lobsters and coffee, and an apparatus for the cooking of toast and mutton chops. Such utensils and luxuries as these did not suffice for the well-being of Tom Towers. He indulged in four rooms on the first floor, each of which was furnished, if not with the splendor, with probably more than the comfort of Stafford House. Every addition that science and art have lately made to the luxuries of modern life was to be found there. The room in which he usually sat was surrounded by bookshelves carefully filled, nor was there a volume there which was not entitled to its place in such a collection, both by its intrinsic worth and exterior splendor. A pretty portable set of steps in one corner of the room showed that those even on the higher shelves were intended for use. The chamber contained but two works of art, the one an admirable bust of Sir Robert Peel by power declared the individual politics of our friend, and the other a singularly long figure of a female devotee by Millet told equally plainly the school of art to which he was addicted. This picture was not hung, as pictures usually are, against the wall. There was no inch of wall vacant for such a purpose. It had a stand or desk erected for its own accommodation, and there, on her pedestal, framed and glazed, stood the devotional lady looking intently at a lily as no lady ever looked before. Our modern artists, whom we style pre-Raphaelites, have delighted to go back, not only to the finish and peculiar manner, but also to the subjects of the early painters. It is impossible to give them too much praise, for the elaborate perseverance with which they have equaled the minute perfections of the masters, from whom they take their inspiration. Nothing, probably, can exceed the painting of some of these latter-day pictures. It is, however, singular into what faults they fall as regards their subjects. They are not quite content to take the old stock groups, a Sebastian with his arrows, a Lucia with her eyes in a dish, a Lorenzo with a gridiron, or the Virgin with two children. But they are anything but happy in their change. As a rule, no figure should be drawn in a position which it is impossible to suppose any figure should maintain. The patient endurance of St. Sebastian, the wild ecstasy of St. John in the wilderness, the maternal love of the Virgin, are feelings naturally portrayed by a fixed posture. But the lady with the stiff back and bent neck, who looks at her flower and is still looking from hour to hour, gives us an idea of pain without grace and abstraction without a cause. It was easy from his rooms to see that Tom Towers was a Sybarite, though by no means an idle one. He was lingering over his last cup of tea, surrounded by an ocean of newspapers, through which he had been swimming, when John Bold's card was brought in by his tiger. This tiger never knew that his master was at home, though he often knew that he was not, and thus Tom Towers was never invaded but by his own consent. On this occasion, after twisting the card twice in his fingers, he signified to his attendant imp that he was visible, and the inner door was unbolted and our friend announced. I have before said that he of the Jupiter and John Bold were intimate. There was no very great difference in their ages, for Towers was still considerably under forty, and when Bold had been attending the London hospitals, Towers, who was not then the great man that he had since become, had been much with him. Then they had often discussed together the objects of their ambition and future prospects. Then Tom Towers was struggling hard to maintain himself as a briefless barrister, by shorthand reporting for any of the papers that would engage him. Then he had not dared to dream of writing leaders for the Jupiter or canvassing the conduct of cabinet ministers. Things had altered since that time. The briefless barrister was still briefless, but now he despised briefs. Could he have been sure of a judge's seat, he would hardly have left his present career. It is true he wore no ermine, bore no outward marks of a world's respect, 
but with what a load of inward importance was he charged it is true his name appeared in no large capitals on no wall was chalked up tom towers forever freedom of the press and tom towers but what member of parliament had half his power it is true that in far-off provinces men did not talk daily of Tom Towers, but they read the Jupiter, and acknowledged that without the Jupiter life was not worth having. This kind of hidden but still conscious glory suited the nature of the man. He loved to sit silent in a corner of his club, and listen to the loud chatterings of politicians, and to think how they all were in his power. How he could smite the loudest of them, were it worth his while to raise his pen for such a purpose. He loved to watch the great men of whom he daily wrote, and flatter himself that he was greater than any of them. Each of them was responsible to his country, each of them must answer if inquired into, each of them must endure abuse with good humor, and insolence without anger. But to whom was he, Tom Towers, responsible? No one could insult him. No one could inquire into him. He could speak out withering words, and no one could answer him. Ministers courted him, though perhaps they knew not his name. Bishops feared him. Judges doubted their own verdicts unless he confirmed them. And generals, in their councils of war, did not consider more deeply what the enemy would do than what the Jupiter would say. Tom Towers never boasted of the Jupiter. He scarcely ever named the paper even to the most intimate of his friends. He did not even wish to be spoken of as connected with it, but he did not the less value his privileges, or think the less of his own importance. It is probable that Tom Towers considered himself the most powerful man in Europe, and so he walked on from day to day, studiously striving to look a man, but knowing within his breast that he was a god. End of chapter 14. Recording by Jessica Louise, St. Paul, Minnesota.